Uh, very, very welcome to everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, this is basically part two of um, what has been a really successful series on uh, entitled Rethinking History, Returning to the Archives and Documents. And it's a, a joint uh, initiative by uh, the Toronto Centre for Iranian Studies and Professor Mohamed Tabakulitari and his team, and our team here in Oxford, which is the Invisible East team. Uh, and we have a really exciting program. We've put together an exciting program for this semester for you, and um, we will continue to have more in future semesters. Just to quickly run you through what we have arranged for you for the fall term. So today's uh, very exciting paper will be delivered um, uh, on the archival remnants of art uh, or an intimate lunch with Abu Turab Ghaffari, um, by Shabnam uh, Rahimi Gulhandon of the University of Toronto, so a local to those of you in Toronto. Um, I'll just quickly tell you next month, uh, if you want to mark your calendars now on this Monday, so it's an unusual day because usually it's always been on a Thursday. This is the one exception where it's on a Monday, the 16th of October, at same time, so 12 noon Toronto time, 5 p.m. UK time, we go back in history to Iranian language Bactrian documents from Afghanistan with Reza Hosseini of the University of Cambridge here in the UK. Um, then in November, thurs Thursday, the 16th of November, uh, the topic will be in search of urban geopolitics, deep Mapping Tehran's Lalazar District, 1880 to 1960, with Ida Miftahi of Boise State University. And then the last one of this term will be in December, Thursday, the 14th of December, again, same time. And it will be uh, on Persian Qutb Shahi documents from India with Ifa Otman from the University of Göttingen in Germany. So really, I think, exciting uh, program again with different periods covered, different regions covered, but always focused on um, Iranian language documents. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm really delighted to uh, introduce to you our speaker for today, Shabnam Gulhandon, who is a doctoral candidate at the Department of History of Art at Yale University and the recently appointed manager of the Tavakuli archives. No points for guessing which Tavakuli we're talking about. Previously, she held research fellowships at Yale University's Art Gallery, and before that, in the Freer Gallery at the Smithsonian. Her academic history also includes an MA in the history of, mod of the modern Middle East and a BA in art history, both from the University of Toronto. Gulhandan's academic interests include, along with the broader subject of the history of the modern Middle East, the historiography of Islamic art, the intermingling of text and image in the pictorial arts of the Middle East through the centuries, and the relationship between photography, painting, and print in the last half of the 19th century in Iran. Her diverse experiences have afforded her a globally aware frame of reference steeped in vernacular modes of inquiry and practice in places such as Cairo, Istanbul, Tbilisi, Tabriz, Tehran, Mashhad, and Bombay. And with that, I will hand over to Professor Tavakolitari to uh, make his expression of support in Canada. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Azad. At the outset, and before introducing 
the speaker, I would like to express our collective gratitude to Canada's Indigenous people and acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto and the Elohe Omidyarum Jalali Institute of Iranian Studies operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Vandat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississauga of Credit River. Today, this meeting place continues to be the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live, learn, and teach in their ancestral homeland. Professor Azad, please. Back okay. To you. Thank you. Well, um, so just a quick reminder of how we do this. So uh, Shabnam will give her presentation. I think it's, did you say about 25 minutes or so, half an hour? So around then, uh, around that. And then uh, we will open the floor to questions and discussions. If we could ask you to kindly mute yourselves throughout uh, Shabnam's presentation, we'd be very grateful. Shabnam, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Many thanks, Dr. Azad, and um, thank you for getting me into the series. I've been, um, as some of you might know, I've been dealing with the subject for quite a while now. Uh, but the the kind of the recent um, developments of it have come about after engaging more closely with um, lithographs of the Talakoti archives, as you heard. Um, so uh, my subject is of main subject of interest is the art of Qajar period, but um, I have been trying to figure out a way into understanding this art as a um, um, as one that can connect all of its different medias and um, and interpretations. Um, so um, this part of it is is relatively recent. So I um, I hope to get all of your feedback and hopefully help me answer some questions in the middle too. Let me see if I can. Okay, so the small watercolor painting, um, it is roughly five by five and a half inches by Sani Al Mulk Abdul Hassan Khona Afwari Koshani, um, is supposedly still housed in a private collection in Italy. Uh, the painting is signed and dated right there in the middle on what looks like a window ledge or a short wall, separating the two groups of attendees. The signature reads Ragam Abul Hassan Nagosh Bashi Rafori Sane Hazal Devistushastoik. Or literally the trace of Abul Hassan, uh, the painter, Rafori, the year of 1845. The unfinished piece, and um, by unfinished, I'm just going to point out to this dangling pieces of paper that are all over the kind of unfinished groundwork here and the detectable penciled uh, outlines everywhere. Um, depicts what seems to be an after-meal encounter, the arrival of the Galeon uh, from the right and the supposedly retrieval of the uh, brass basin um, from the left side of the image signals the, the transients, the fragility of this moment. And it is it is a moment of significance. It's enveloped in, between um, two seemingly um, uh, opposing um, sides. Um, it's seeming, it seems to be of a conversation that precedes the end of a conciliatory event of sharing a meal or a souffre. The facing off of two groups separated by the clear demarcation of the wall in between and the relationship to the observer. Uh, one group in clear upward and forward thrust, papers squashed in fists, arms slightly raised, the other seemingly motionless and passive. Neither of those two groups or event or the event is of my immediate concern here. The intervening fleeting moment though is uh, one of little consequence to the two events, but um, seemingly the the link between the two, the ritual that bridges the gap between the courtiers and the rest, the sharing of the meal, and the uh, opposing views and the viewpoints that emerge after. In search for a context, one comes up short in the history of contemporaneous painting, or even within the roster of Abdul Hassan Khan's own past and present works. The tiny watercolor doesn't resemble any 
any arts of, of, of the painter's earlier works. It doesn't fit within any of his known commissions of the time either. The enigmatic subject matter hasn't lent itself well to scholarly interest either. The painterly interest in the fleeting appearance of the two servants seems like a peculiar diversion from a composition that otherwise renders a relatively uncomplicated narrative. Um, but those two figures are not that easy to ignore. Now, as I said before, if we search for meaning in this painting and other paintings of the same time and period an artist, little by way of clarification comes our way. So I'm going to leave it behind, um, even if momentarily, and shift our focus elsewhere. Abul Hassan Khan Sani Al Mulk comes from a formidable painterly heritage and has left a, 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 a remarkably indelible mark on the generation that followed his. Uh, he shared a name and a passion with his great uncle, who was the historian of the Zand Nadiri period, um, Abul Hassan Khan Ghaffari, and he trained with Mehrali, who was the chief painter of the Fatali Shah uh, court, and one of the most prolific painters of what became representative of Qajar large scale oil paintings. Um, he taught painting to his two uh, two nephews, uh, Abu Turab and Muhammad Ghaffari uh, Kamal al Malk. By all accounts, it is an understatement to note that in the family, the two nephews and, uh, and the uncle, um, uh, headed all visual creation associated with the courts of Qajar for over half a century. From the Royal Atelier in charge of producing multi-volume painted manuscripts, such as this, to official newspapers, um, to painting classes in Doral Fanoon, and that's not a painting class, I'll come back to it later, uh, to painting the most iconic scenes of the public life of the capital. Each of these artists recreated the art of his period in the image of his training and patronage. Um, thanks to scholarly connections and interest, we know much about their enviable era marking endeavors, at least in the case of Kamal al and Sani al -Mulk. But I think by, by shining the spotlight on individual stars of this scene, we are neglecting the ground, shifting a little bit under their feet. Now, excursion back to our own obscure painting. I found the painting reproduced in the only Persian catalog as here. Uh, catalog of works by Sani al Molk uh, that was published by Parham and Zoka, um about 20 years ago called The Life and Works of Sani al Molk, as in the Yuva Asar of Sani al Molk. I have looked for its source for the better part of the last decade without much luck and have since made friends with its obscurity. Um, it has shifted the way I look at the art of the last 50 years of 19th century in Iran. The only specific thing I have to locate this painting somewhere, anywhere and anytime, it's the date of 1845, all the well-marked and visible on the painting itself. We know from material remnants that 1845 marks the beginning of Sani al Mulk's individual practice. Um, prior to this date, um, there are pieces of painting left from his, um, uh, from his uh, teacher that is made for him to practice on. So by all account, the depicted scene could be a practice in spatial composition, but Sani al Mulk's inclusion of the servant figures at the far end of the background of the painting has become, or is, is to me at least, the emblem of compositional and contextual devices that have since come to represent the beginning moments of a paradigm shift in the painting and pictorial practices of Iran of 19th century. And um, the shift towards the misnomer that is that is realism, namely the quote unquote correct adaptation of single point perspective for the marcation of space and the depictions of the scenes of everyday life are amongst its two chief representatives. Now there's a whole lot to unpack on that in that last sentence and not all of it is of my immediate interest or of your patience. Uh, one though merits a little bit of a closer scrutiny Decades of scholarship on, uh, scholarship on the art of Bajar period has almost unanimously pointed to photography as the catalyst, motivator, and prime model for the grand total of the affirmation move towards quote-unquote realism. After all, the photograph provided a suitable, historically corroborated, and accurate model for this new painting style. But by 1845, we barely have records of the arrival of the daguerreotypes in Iran. 
our archives point to uh, if the hazy details of this this uh, this this history is to be trusted to 1845 as the year that the first daguerreotype camera arrived in Muhammad Shah's court. Um, but no daguerreotypes definitively have have been recovered from this period. Judging by the scarcity of detail or um, any reports on the extent of the Gertai productions, if indeed more than a few were ever produced, one can safely assume that experimentation and proliferation didn't figure into these early moments of photography's introduction to Qajar court. The assumption is further solidified when we consider for a moment the nature of the medium in these early days. The Gertai's were not easy to produce. The one camera that arrived in Iran in the early 1840s seemingly remained unused until the court of Muhammad Shah hired a photographer by the name of Jules Richard, Monsieur Richard Han, sometimes in the early 1845. The images were costly to produce as well because the, the medium was a silver plate uh, that had to be coated. These images were not reproducible and not necessarily known for their utility in capturing a fleeting moment. It took a rather long exposure to stabilize an image on a silver plate. But if spontaneity wasn't the function of the photographic depiction yet, and if the cost of material and production had not yet facilitated the quote-unquote democratic disposition of the medium, nevertheless, the daguerreotype laid a solid claim to being an actual trace of the reality as it unfolded in front of it. And here is when we encountered the other tawny subject of the quote-unquote realism. The silver plate of the daguerreotype received the light that emanated from the object through the lens of the camera and required recorded it in all its detail, but is our painting's claim to reality based on such detailed formal characteristics? Are the compelling play of light and shade on solid and soft objects in this painting that lay claim to the scene being unfolded in front of the painter? Here is where a magic trick would do the job. What happens if instead of searching for formal or narrative consistently, one searches for temporal markers in the painting? What if the depictions of the two servants in the background indicates the contemporaneity on the scene, unfolding in all its seemingly inconsequential detail in front of the beholder and the painter alike, thus enveloping the moment of the action between the presence of the painter and the viewer and the impending departure of the attendants. The cohabitation of a fleeting moment forces the viewer 150 years later, as it may be, to the space of the painter and the attendees. With that rather lengthy prologue, I would like to now propose a new way of distinguishing between different aspirations and inspirations of painters and painting during the last 50 years of Qajar period that is less concerned with formal spatial attributes and more inclined to slow reading of images as one amongst many of archival, archival remnants of a country that by 1885 was supposedly inundated with images as per the American ambassador to Qajar court, uh, Benjamin. Um, as circular as, as that logic may sound, I would also like to justify my decision to step away from formal characterization of images by pointing to the archival problem of translating the criteria of quote unquote realism to the practices of painting in Iran that at some point or other have been equated with it. Neither Shabi Keshi, which generally refer to portrait paintings, but could also refer to um, to other scenes, nor Nigari, which refers to landscape painting usually, or Farangi Sozi, or Land and Sozi, which literally and conceptually translate to foreign or Western or Land and Sozi, or land making. These firms frequently use, these are paint, terms used by painters to describe their words, neither seem to capture the totality of what realism as a stylistic feature of painting and literature has come to signify in French or American context, for example. But while formal and contextual characteristics of art really provides a consistent frame of analysis for Qajar painting, an ongoing concern with passage of time, with past, present, future, as linear constructs, overwhelms all kinds of not only pictorial, but also literary imaginaries. Fadali Shah's conscious revival of Achaemenid and Sassanian, not Sassanian models have been attributed to the prevalence of the philosophy of the literary movement of Boz Gasht, literary return, which has been argued to be, quote, a consciously promoted minor renaissance and its expression in life-size painting and imagery, end quote. The literary Boz Gasht movement, a term coined as part of the periodization of the 18th and 19th century Persian poetry, 
brought about a conscious emulation of the pre safavid style of poetry in Iran. In conscious rebuttal of the more florid safavid Mughal poetic program, the Sapkeno or Sapkehendi. As a response to the claim of the Indian Mughal school poets to mastery over Persian language, Bosgash movement's literary mimesis has been argued to be a, quote, constitutive event in the formation of a literary canon and an early expression of literary nationalism in Iran, and God. But while the rock reliefs of Atali Shah period lay in claim to an un- ancient heritage in king- king- kingdom, classical books of Persian poetry and prose, such as Shahnameh and Gulistan, were printed in troves in Bombay and Lucknow, in continuation of a tradition that had started over a century prior. On the other hand, royal ateliers of Qajar court followed through with centuries, century-old practices of producing lacquer objects, perfecting practices that translated easily to newer technologies of lithographic print. Pounced cartouches and compositions that still bear the mark of the red and black chalk dust used to translate their designs to the objects underneath them remained in circulation for years to come. Not only that, but the new technologies of print and photography with the shared reliance on paper, both as medium and tool, rapidly adapted to existing practices and designs. These two, um, these two papers um, on the slide are currently in the um, and Harvard, Muse- Harvard Art Museum. They're part of an album. There are quite a few of them. Um, let me see if I can. Yeah, so um, these are... If you see the little dots, those are holes in that paper that will transfer the chalk back to um, back to the surface behind it. This is a relatively common uh, way of of using and reusing these designs for various uh, for various objects. Um, and it's not particular to Qajar period; it has been used before that. Um, there's quite a bit of writing on that um, on the appearance of both uh, this and. Uh, pounce marks on finished paintings that would then show that uh, the other way of using this is basically just to pounce the paper and pounce the paper underneath it and kind of mark the paper with dots. Um, And if you hold the painting up to light, they become visible. Now this is a Kalamdon pen box recently, recently purchased by the Smithsonian Museum's Arthur Sackler Gallery. Penbox is currently dated to early 1880s and is one of its uh, one of many of this genre. Lacquer mirror cases, pen boxes, albums, and book covers adorned with photographs or in one way or another during translation to painting abound at this point. Now, in the case of this one, the photograph of Nasruddin Shah is flanked by photographs of the Crown Prince Muzaffaruddin. Uh, I don't have a close-up image. It's on top, um, on 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 top of the image, possibly uh, by one on the right-hand side of the Shah and uh, with the sword and three other princes of the Qajar dynasty th- that occupy the top of the box. The vignettes are flanked by lines of poetry from the 12th century poet Baba Afsal Kashani. The couplet reads: "Mardi bayat bulant hemat mardi." این تجربه دیده خیرت پروردی کورا به تصرف اند در این عالم خاک بر دامن همت ننشیند گردی I am not proficient enough to translate this completely but the couplet is asking for a man of experience whose lofty aspirations are not to be sullied by the dust of this insignificant world This choice of poem and poet is surprising to say the least the first compilation of the Baba Afsar poetry was published in 1902 by Ali Khulikhan Dole, the first minister of telegraph in Iran if indeed the pen box belongs to the late 19th century, which I think is debatable, the choice might signal a close connection between the commission of the pen box and the family of Mokhbar Dole, whose father, Reza Ghali Khan Hedayat, the Qajar poet and literary man, was appointed head of the school of Dar al-Fanun and then the direct teacher of the crown prince, Muzaffar bin Mirza. This other Pen box has a similarly fascinating association. The distinguished man whose portrait adorns the top of the pen box is possibly Mehdi Khan Musavar al Mulk, the distinguished painter of the late Nasiri period. 
and the painter of portraits in the first fully illustrated newspaper of um, Sharafat. Little is known about him, um, but he has certainly held a studio in Dara Sanaya School of Art and has trained students proficient in both watercolor and oil on canvas. It seems also that in the late 1900s, he took over the photographic studio of Rusi Khan, a prolific commercial photographer of the late 19th century in Iran. The painting on the box depicts the painter in the prose, in the pose and attire of men of letter. The arrangement is almost entirely replicated in many official photographic portraits of the time. A table with a book against which the subject leaned, the long coat and the pinstripe pants which signaled his social standing, the glasses and the sharp glance which signaled his intellectual status, supposedly, or all the bread and butter of commercial photographic studios of the late 19th century in Iran. If I'm reading this correctly, and I'm reading this mostly based on pose and attire, to, um, uh, uh, to the early 20th century, the attire might also signal the political leanings of Musabar al Mulk. Iran's constitutional revolution of 1906 to 1911 was a particularly bloody one for the intellectual literati of the time. Their opposition to the establishment of the monarchy resulted in the brutal heading of some of the most talented journalists of the time. In the Bagh Shah, the residence and the later headquarters of the Qajar royalty, the choice of pose, attire, and demeanor that signals a multi-layered self-fashioning on the part of the painter and his intellectual aspirations, the painter that is being painted. On the other hand, the rest of the Qalamdan's design very much adheres to the traditional systems of decorations of the object, the floral background, punctured but idiosyncratic arrangements of the frame with the main vignette, and you can see the pounce, uh, the pounce dots on, on, on the sides as well. Now I want to just invite our, um, our original subject of this um, of this paper um, to join us. He has remained in the shadows of his pioneering uncle and his perfectionist brother, Abu Turab Khan Ghafari Karshani, had a rather disrupted career compared to the other two luminaries in his family. Um, he worked uh, primarily to illustrate Sharaf, and then he took his life supposedly at the age of 27. Um, and um, he has left very little by way of um, of individual paintings other than what we see in Shara. It seems like his claim to fame is solely related to his production in the newspaper of Shara, where he recreated in print um, the portraits of court officials of varying importance, as well as exclusively detailed depictions of the important landmarks of Tehran. I want to just briefly draw your attention to his signed painting of Takia Dolat. The painting pre precedes the famous Kamal ul Mulk painting of the same space by at least half a decade. The addition of the Iwan uh, on the top floor and the central chandelier that replaced the top stand with the five standing lamps is, a clear, is an indication of the time difference. I have yet to come across a contemporaneous photograph that would capture such a view of the space. Given the development of the technology of photography at the time, I doubt any camera could capture the details of the scene to the extent that Abu Turab has done. As you see, there, um, there are players on the stage and then there are um, audience members around and the details of the, uh, of the main frame on the back. Um, Given the debate, um, I, um, Abu Turab's utilitarian view of photography is an exhibit elsewhere, though, in Sharaf. But his view of the te te technology and his treatment of these, these paper objects as a tool, um, like others, cannot be overstated. Now, another version to our, to our painting um, and bringing um, bringing it back to Abu Turab. In Gulistan Palace archives, there's a sketch of the back of Itamada Sultana, Sani Adole, Sani Adole, Qajar historian, and the king's confidant and translator by the reigning Qajar king, Nasr al Shah. So that painting is by Nasr al Shah. The sketch, dated to the 19th Namazan of 2090 or November 10th of 1873, 
bears an obvious resemblance to this photograph, of which not much is known. A handwritten note on the side of the sketch makes note of the presence of Dakos Bashi, the court photographer. And even though I haven't yet seen the original image decipher his role in the creation of the sketch, it might very well be that the two images have more in common than so far imagined. Maybe that Akos Bashi was asked to take a photograph of Ehtemad al-Saltane for the sketching amusement of the king. But what is indisputable is that, much like the painterly traditions of manuscript painting, as Roxburgh observed in uh, in the albums of Top Copy Palace um, about 10 years before this, the Qajar painter Abu Turab, Qajar painters like Abu Turab, laid claim to various elemental compositions to construct an image. As you see in this in this um, depiction of a classroom in Dar al Fanun, which is not the painting classroom, it's a um, it's a um, uh, it's a classroom of Zainul Abedin Hamedani, um, Ali ibn Zainul Abedin Hamedani, who is the author of Jawahar Tashri. Um, uh, this painting actually um, uh, uh, comes at the beginning of the book, um, um, and the painting is by Abu Turab. Um, and this um, this is not the only instance in which this composition appears um, in um, in lithography. But as you see in this in this um, uh, translation across media, the same techniques that are used for for centuries in constructing. A, uh, a collage the space based on elements used from other spaces, from f- photographs, from from drawings, and from paintings, still continues to be prevalent for painters like Abu Turab. This uh, image of Sharaf, which I had a photograph of beside it, um, is one that um, is clearly juxtaposed, can be juxtaposed clearly on top of the photograph uh, of a photograph by the same um, from the same vantage point, but one that has all the uh, attendees in front of it lining up. I haven't been able to find a good um, image of uh, a good good resolution uh, reproduction of that photograph, so I'm not able to show you, but um, the the one-to-one relationship between this particular lithograph and the photograph is such that makes it very clear that the photograph was, was, was used like the transparent Pounced uh, papers that um, were used by uh, by um, by painters of of lacquer painting or something else to construct this. Now we have recordings of Abu Turab actually painting directly on the pieces of marble or marmar or limestone that would then be used for lithographic productions as well. That he would draw on it uh, with oil uh, crayons. So he's using all these technologies to to make his lithographs, but this one um, seems to be one of the transfer model that um, uh, uh, photographs was pounced to make this resultant image um, uh, on Sharaf, and there are many more like this. Um, and so um, because this didn't go into my presentation, my PowerPoint, I'm just going to. Um, Kind of stop there halfway through and and just mention that um, this uh, intermediate translation of images between um, f- photographs, lacquer painting traditions, uh, lithography is not just about the um, it's not just about the images rep- producing the same image, but it's it's carrying over technology that um, that is being used uh, by by painters for, has been used by painters for centuries. Um, and that is to um, to make copies of paper originals on different media and then um, use the technologies of that media to reproduce the image in bulk and in numbers. Um, and many of them exist in lithographic archives uh, and the translucent. So the transfer lithography technology um, was based on this particular model that you write uh, or draw on a translucent piece of paper, and then that translucent piece of paper would be used to transfer the image on the lithographic stone in mirror image, which would then be able to again mirror it again and print it on the next page that is on it. 
uh, which kind of um, made it easier to to produce the image because you would have you wouldn't have to write from uh, left to right basically mirror image on the stone directly. But for images such as this, both both uh, technology were in use. Um, uh, at least in Iran and Bombay so far as we know. Um, we have remnants of the translucent paper in the archives that point to their use in Bombay. And we have um, very similar objects in the Malik Museum that point to them being in use in Iran as well. So the transfer lithograph technology is not just a South Asian uh, or an Indian uh, phenomenon. They were very widely used in Iran as well. Um, uh, we, have the, we have the translucent paper to that effect. I wasn't able to get a picture of our own uh, they were deep in the boxes, um, and I went. I, I wasn't going to drag them out um, in fear of um, harming them. Uh, but we have those papers from the uh, Munshi Kishor um, um, printing house in the Talakoli archives. Um, they were used to print um, uh, on lithographic stone. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if I went too fast or too slow, uh, but. Um, that was about as much as I, I wanted to say at this point. Thank you so much, Shabnam John. That was an, a really fun and amazing and beautiful presentation. I really enjoyed these images. I'm They're totally new to me. And I'm sure there are lots of questions. Um, and please, while people think about their questions, um, please do raise your, raise your hand um, using the reaction function down at the bottom of your screen or right into the chat box. Um, meanwhile, Shabnam John, I'd like to start by asking you two things. One is, how does your presentation and this focus on uh, Abu Turaba Ghaffari's work um, feature in your PhD? Could you tell us a little bit about your PhD research? I'm really interested in that. And secondly, as a non-art historian, to me, it looks like there's also a medium or a technique of watercolor painting used. Is that right? And where is that coming from? Is that a European influence? Or, uh, and I, I apologize in advance if this is a very basic question from a from a pure historian. No, no, absolutely, um, absolutely warranted. Um, um, so I my focus is initially started from just looking at photographs and trying to figure out why we um, deem photography as the motivator of, of this new mode of painting in Iran. Um, and the more I looked uh, into more forgotten things like lithographs and reproductions of these on paper, um, the dates, the more the dates didn't match. So I know when photography arrived, we know what the technology was, was at the beginning. And so, um, and we know what painters of the Zandan uh, period we're doing um, by way of finding Sazi or, or adopting perspective or thinking through perspective. And we know how painters before them treated formal devices such as perspective. They were aware of it. They were not fond of them because we because the painters painted in a in a different um, compositional manner um, than um, than what was the European model for painting. So um, I started looking at those and then um, it came to be that the um the shared kind of um ethos in all of these productions uh from as far back as Fatali Shah period to as late as the as the beginning of the Pahlavi period is a um is a uh, kind of fascination with the portrayal of 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 a new portrayal of of time maybe and temporality. Um, and there are different signifiers that I've found in different paintings. So if, for example, you look at, and I, I have some to show you, if you like, if you look at the productions of um, of Hezori Yikshab uh, that Sani al is, is is known for, um, there, is a, there is a deliberate um, mixing of old styles of clothing, for example, with new ways of congregating new definitions of space. Uh, with with compositions that are directly coming out of photographs. So we have photographs that are composed of three seated figures, and then you can just take those three seated figures and find them exactly in the minute in the painting. But the clothing, the attire, um, is is harkening back to a period that is before the production of that. So there is a there is a clear attempt to bring about 
different temporalities in that painting, and that's necessitated by that book, which is a book of no time. It's a mythical kind of story that then can be um, symbolically related to events of the day, which mm -hmm. again, it does. So you see, for example, portrayals of Amir Kabir in a very mythical kind of encounter. So you see this bringing about of that of that mythical time or that mythical past into the presence of, of events. And you see that formally and you see that contextually uh, and, and, and in content. So that, that figuring out the relationship between these elements seems to be something that is not just particular to, to Sani al Mulk, but kind of runs through, um, uh, through these productions up until later Kamal al Mulk kind of productions almost. Um, so, um, and that's where you get a lot more formal um, or engagement with, with just purely formal characteristic rather than um, uh, than than these plays with temporal temporality. So that's that's where my kind of thoughts have gone for my PhD. That instead of separating them into a miniature period, an Islamic period, and then a kind of an intervening intervening, no one knows what's happening period, and then a, a, a final modernist realist, whatever that called uh, period, looking at it through concerns that are shifting for these painters um, that are then mirrored in other archival um, um, kind of um, documents as well. Um, so that's that's the one question. Now, as for the watercolor, we know that this particular kind of watercolor painting is very similar to the style that is being used for miniature painting as well. So we, we, we use these these kinds of color, but, but now at this point in time, Color is also being imported to Iran, um, so you have um, you have new um, new colors that are being uh, that are coming in that are uh, facilitating a more um, kind of um, um, uh, a more translucent um, 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 a more translucent appearance, which this particular painting does have. Now I can't say if that's because it's not finished, and it would have been finished and looked like a miniature painting with the same vibrant colors or is it just the use of these new kinds of colors that are being um being kind of experimented with at this point in time um but um but but watercolor painting is 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 pretty um is pretty commonly used um both in iran both in tehran and elsewhere so we have we have uh, studios in, in isfahan and tehran uh, in, and and shiraz who are uh, who are then producing large watercolor paintings Mm -hmm. Thank I hope you. I kind of uh, went about roundabout way of answering questions. Thank you. And before I pass the word to, I have two very patient uh, participants. Uh, uh, I was curious to know what, why, what makes you call these paintings documents? Because to me, documents as a historian mean something very particular. It's, it's, it's bits of writing that are written for a very daily sort of day-to-day -day purpose, like a, a letter or a contract or um, an inventory or note to self. What makes these to you documents? Why do you call them documents? Because I read them as such. I read I read them, I literally read them. So when I'm looking at these, this particularly really small painting, which actually doesn't exist the way we frame art which is framed on the wall none of these exist in that they're all small intimate objects that um, that exist in um, in in albums or in books um, they're readable in that sense meaning that I can look at them and I can see inconsistencies and I can see um, so for example for this particular painting when I showed it to Dr. Amonat years ago um, and I kind of told him of my kind of struggle with this particular dating on it um, he said that um, the rise of the Bobby movement is exactly that date. So that interfacing could be read very much archivally against a, a, a rising um, a movement within the Iranian modern history that very, very much would then kind of um, feed into this, this, this um, depiction of the two opposing scenes, one of them being in the attire of the Dorothy students which you see with the hats on and the 
um, and the and the hair being on the both sides. Um, so these are these are young Darul Fanun students who are now they have their backs to you, and the front space being a space of um, somebody who is more in the religious attire, maybe. So there there are ways to read these images as part of archival um, part of archival um, residues of history. The only issue we have with them is that because of what has happened with the art market and the dealing of 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 these paintings outside, is that they're usually separated from the context in which they originally appeared. So it's a little bit more of a detective work to figure out exactly where they were produced in or for, um, the, if they were part of an album, if they were part of a uh, a book, if they were part of a dossier, for example. Um, mm. We have less of that issue with photography because we have actual official albums that remain the same. Photographs alone, thankfully, in many cases, did not have that much of a value to be separated from the album. But mm -hmm. we still run into that, that issue with paintings. Uh, mm -hmm. But they are, for all intents and purposes, for me at least, part of a readable archive and as such mm -hmm. treated as documents. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to just point to one more thing, and that is that the the kind of frameable, put on the wall, devoid of kind of literary and archival context art is not our, um, is actually an outlier in the history of, of painting, at least in the Middle East and partly in Iran, right? Art came in a book, either be it in history or, or, or poetry or, uh, or diary, it always was accompanied as part of the book. It, um, it existed within that book context. So I'm not taking it to a new end. I'm just refinding its its location uh, where it's appropriate. So I'm not putting oil paintings in in a in a book, but I'm kind of finding the pieces that would be appropriate in that context. Thank you so much. Um, Joanna de Groot has been waiting patiently. Hi, Joanna. Please. Good to so. see you. Okay. Can people hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for that paper. I really loved it. I've I've, I've been in love with that little watercolor ever since I first found <laughs> it on some uh, Google Images place or other. Um, and if I may, I'd like to sort of raise a couple of general issues, but also some a bit more specific ones. So mm -hmm. the specific, I'll get the specific ones out of the way. Um, was the paper that you talked about the transparent paper? A local product or an imported product or both? And that that pertains to some interesting things you've been saying about this kind of art practice relying both on indigenous and on in incoming resources of one sort or another, be that artistic training or the actual material content of paintings and lithographs and watercolors and photographs and so on. By the way, I completely agree that art that art objects paintings photos lithos are absolutely documents from the past that we should read as you have so wonderfully done um i wanted to ask again my other specific question was something about whether the training that people got in lithography and in these because lithography is a relatively new practice obviously in the 19th century was undertaken separately from other aspects of art training or whether it was part of a general art training, as it were? Did you learn it? Did you have to go off to a specialised lithographer to train to do it or not? But then I just wondered, because I got very excited about the, the thoughts you were throwing out, the one or two general issues I wondered if you could say a little bit more about. I think you've made a very persuasive case for having a more complex view of new, old, continuing, changing stuff. Um, and I, 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 I thought that worked very well. And I'm just wondering if it's possible to compare um, Sunny Almok, for example, with someone like Jalayeri. Uh, I'm just thinking of some visual material of his that I've worked with, where you see exactly the sort of things that you were, some of the things you were showing. My other question is actually what is being, to, to, if you could say more about what is being depicted in that magical little watercolour. 
Um, is it a social moment? You interpret it as a moment of conflict and of different, ad, almost adversarial. I mean, I can. It's it certainly a, a. It's got diversity in it. If we look at the clothes and the postures of the people, I've noticed how delightfully the servants' faces are put in in this very informal style, as opposed to the faces of the turban participants in the event. And I'm just wondering what what you think, what cultural work, and this is me, it's a non-art historian's question. I'm a sort of cultural historian, I suppose, not a, I haven't been trained as an art historian, although I work with art objects. Um, what do you think the cultural work is being done? Because it seems to me that it draws on both older traditions of depicting social encounters, but also is doing it in a different way. There's something, there's something different and new going on which isn't a break with the past, but it's, it's as it were, repurposing, if you want to put it this way, a genre or a style of representing a, a social moment for what might be slightly different purposes or with slightly different meanings. I, we can't talk about purpose. I hope I haven't talked too much. I actually had a string of other thoughts, but I don't want to occupy too much space in this event. So I'll pause there and just thank you again. I've enjoyed it so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this really valuable intervention. Um, now also very patiently waiting is Leila Muslimi Mehni. Please unmute yourself and ask your question or make your comment. Um, thank you so much, uh, Shabnam John, with the, with the very interesting talk that you have. And especially I was really uh, joyed with the uh, the variety of the picture that you actually provided and you know explain um i have a specific question about the color uh, uh how do you see the experimentation of the artists especially in this uh, uh, like in terms of usage of color the you uh, color application in this realistic uh, uh um, painting uh as opposed to the colorless motion of the uh, of the lithographs, you know, at that moment of the time, and also how do you see uh, how do you see the usage of color as a trend, like you know, uh, for 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 the like you know um, um, development of the uh, co contemporary. Uh, kind of painting later on uh, in the late Qajar and beginning of the Pahlavi era. Thank you so much. Big questions. <laughs> I need to write two more papers. <laughs> should I answer these questions or should I wait, wait for <laughs> Dr. Simicheva? Well, if you want to give it a go. <laughs> um. Sure. Um, so um, I'm just going to start with the paper because that's what Dr. Dubois <laughs> asked. Um, so for the um, for the um, lacquer painting paper, uh, we know that the paper is relatively local, meaning that they it's normal. It's not a particularly difficult paper. Um, the ones that I've seen at the Harvard Museum. Um, at least the ones in the album that I've taken a photographs of of those two paint those two um, um, are just a little bit thinner than the painting the 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 painting the miniature painting um, paper that was there but it seems of very similar quality. Um, we know that the transfer paper for lithographs though um, are where. Uh, sometimes imported. I haven't come across a definitive quote of them being imported to Iran at that point. I know, for example, that limestone uh, was also imported, but but the ones that are experimented on, they don't seem to be, um, at least not the ones that Sanya, uh, Sanya and Mork is using for uh, for the Sharaf, because we have limestone. Um, uh, but um, the quality of the limestone seems to be okay for lithography to that point. But the paper is a different issue because I um, I haven't seen a reference to the paper, the translucent paper of lithography being imported to Iran. Uh, now, if there is an import happening, um, my guess would be to look into India and to look into Lucknow and Bombay and those printing houses because the books are already coming. 
the technology is very much um, this similar. Um, uh, um, I would think that if they're coming, that might be the route that they're coming rather than uh, being imported um, somewhere else. Uh, but no, unfortunately, I haven't come across um, uh, because, um, I mean, in the case of translucent paper photography, it's really important also the, the quality of the burnishing on top. So um, I know that people have, have been really engaged with this conversation outside of Iran. For example, China is, is a good case, but I genuinely haven't come across any documents talking about them being imported to Iran. Now, um, I um, about the training of lithography, um, Sanya Malk himself was trained uh, outside of Iran when he brought the devices in Iran. That much we know. We also know that he trained Abu Torab himself in lithography. So that's one thing. In the in the lineage of Abu Torab, Abu Torab was the one that took on his lithography, his, his uncle's lithography basically practice more than Kamal al who kind of took on a more paintedly um, disposition basically. Um, but as part of cartography, I think there's documentation, and I have to go and look, find a citation. But as part of the course on cartography, I think lith because so lithographs, one of the main purposes they serve was to reproduce the maps of the city as well. So these reproductions are all lithograph lith reproductions. Um, so I know that as part of cartography, they have been taught in Doral Funnel, but not taught as a separate practice, but as a practice of how to reproduce the image. Uh, but I'm not sure if lithography stood on its own as a course in Doral Fonun. I haven't come across it in the rosters of courses um, that I've seen a couple of them popping up here and there about lithography. Um, so um, in the case of Abu Torab, I know he was trained in it. Um, and I know it's part of the cartography training. Uh, but that's almost as much as I know. There are also not that many... Um, because of the technology, it seems like lithography, at least at that point in time, is very much an artist's work. Um, so it comes with an artist training, or a, like because because it's all painting and drawing on either the stone directly or on the transfer paper, and then delicately transferring it to the stone. It's 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 a chemical work on the stone, but the original production is an artistic production by all accounts. You have to be a calligrapher or a painter to be able to produce the original. Now, when the original is produced, then you have many ways of reproducing it. But from publications like Sharaf or Sharafat or Ablul Matin or, or these early newspapers, Ruzami Elia, there doesn't seem to be anywhere else than, than the same stone is being used to produce the lithograph. So I haven't seen, for example, the exact same image that is being produced in Ruzami Elia then being produced in a book by a different publishing house at the same time or a little bit later. So it seems like the stones and the designs on them remained within the same newspaper or or publishing house. So that's something I haven't come across. Jalayeri is something I like to think about. Thank you for pointing it out. I I, I see your point that there are themes that carry over. Um, I haven't looked at Jalayeri in detail, to be honest, um, just because I've been um more kind of um um i've been more bothered let's say by how to frame this photograph in the context of 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 the same artists or or the or of people really closely associated to it just trying to find if there is a formal link to it but um but going the way I'm going, I think I'm going to come across Jalayari. So I'm going to have an answer for you hopefully later. Let's put it that way. And about reading the painting, I actually, um, uh, because of those two servants, I read it as as the finishing of a lunch. I know that, for example, in Dar al Fanun, the students were provided the lunch uh, and they sometimes uh, engage after lunch in, co in conversations. Um, so I have a context for lunch being in the context of a conversation, of a lively conversation. Let's put it that way. Um, they were being um, in a or in a more um, formal kind of non-courtly, non-familial, non-celebratory context. I know lunch, for example, was part of the Torah for noon kind of day, daily life. Um, 
but given that it this painting might have the link to the Bob B movement or might have some relationship to that debate, um, I also think that it's a device um, that coming of the hookah and leaving of the basin or or uh, or that that moment is more of a temporal device that that seems to kind of link to the to the moment that preceded this moment of debate to the to the shared moments of kind of sitting together and having a meal and then now a division that 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 requires a conversation and a debate and a um, and a monazera maybe um so i've i know that one of my friends have worked on the context of monazera at this period i've i've talked to him about it uh, whether we have a formal kind of framework around monazeras at this time and he hasn't come across one so this might be a very run of the mill um a monazera that's happening in Dora Funun after lunch it might have nothing to do with any particular big event around it uh but um again i don't know if i can find a trace of that at least i haven't yet dela john about the color mm-hmm. um i mean we have colored lithographs you know that you've seen them um so lithographs even though they're black and white they're then colored afterwards um i also know that for example abu torab had a plethora of productions of the same scene, one in, in, in watercolor, then another one in in this lithograph, and then another one in drawing. So the, the it seems like the um the kind of the absence of color in the lithographic context wasn't something that was necessarily a big problem <laughs> or something that that I've noticed people writing about it or commenting about it. Um um but i also know that abu torab himself has created and i showed one of them has created paintings in in a in an enviable shade kind of bracket of gray um so i think um he is concerned i mean the for the the one that I showed just uh, and that's one of the ones that I really like um if I can find it again oh yeah here yeah. let's see if I can show you this one um again <sighs> sorry I know I'm taking a while oh come on oh, oh my computer is not working okay oh uh, here we go So this one uh, is by Autorab, and it is a painting, um, but it's it's um, it's in just various shades of of brownish gray to bluish gray to to black. Um, so I think in the particular case of Abu Torab, he is rather comfortable with the black and white. And given that I haven't seen many colored um, paintings of his, um, I would say that this is um, this is partly his fascination with lithography as well, that he can produce these in, in lithographs in the shades that he wants in the variation of the shade. Um, I very- honestly have very, very little to say about how it affected painting in the Pahlavi period at this point in time. It hasn't been my, it hasn't been my favorite subject to, to attack at this point. But we can have a conversation later on where you can educate me. I'm happy to listen. Thank you, Shabna John. That was a long list of big questions, and I think you answered them beautifully. Um, I I just wanted to there's there was a hand, and I will ask in a minute whether the person still wants to ask their question. And just to say that Joanna de Groot just mentioned, I think that Matsov's work suggests that there is a master craftsman tradition of lithography. I agree with you that we can read the 1840s as a moment of cultural transition in a number of spheres, including religion. 
Um, um, so I just wanted to ask um, Marta, is she still here? Sorry, I forget yep. this. I ah, Simi, 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 you had your Simi. hand up for a long time. Yes. Did you still want to ask your question? Yeah, it is a very short question, actually, uh, by a person who is not involved with the arts as such. Uh, I was wondering why Shabnam was quote unquoting uh, realistic paintings. In this case, they they seem very real. I had an explanation, and then I took it out because I thought the the non art historians are going to kill me on this. Um, so when in the in my context of work, when I say yeah, realism, it usually in my training it relates to a very particular movement in the French and an American context where you attribute a particular engagement with the daily life that is almost a political stand as well so you you take this uh they take this stand of 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 depicting the ordinary man the the laborer the the industrial man um in opposition to the romanticist not the opposition but it kind of a differentiation with romanticist or with uh with uh with abstractionist or something like that that you you commit yourself in a very um, morally justified version of of depicting your surroundings. So that's the quote unquote realism for me. So when we apply it, or when it has been applied to the context of Iran, it's usually been in 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 formal um, characterization. Um, so it it for me becomes a quote unquote because it has it it has come to signify a different thing that is usually associated with the terminology. We don't associate Kamal al-Mark with a particularly political stand, though we might have to revisit that at some point, um, when he's depicting um, um, a, a, a scene in the daily life uh, of of a Falgir, for example, or, or something like that. So we have come to regard it as, as, as attention to perspective, which we were missing apparently in miniature painting. We didn't know about it. Seems like it. Um, and um, attention to light and shade, to 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 volume making. It's more formal. It it has less to do with the kind of moral con content based uh, definitions of realism, so far as I understand it. Thank you for that. Um, and my next uh, here is with Jane Lewis. Yeah. Jane, please go ahead. Unmute yourself. Um, good to see you. Salam, Shannon. Hey, Mamnoon. Hey, can you hear me? Can I? Am I yes, we speaking? can hear you. Uh, okay, because I have my earphones and I can't hear myself. But in any <laughs> case, <laughs> I just uh, something I wanted to just mention, and you may be familiar with this. I don't know, but you know, there's this uh, all of these uh, uh, transfer technology. Of course, is widely used in ceramics too. And um, and you have particularly this is one room that I know of in in Moshe Dole's basement, which was used for mm -hmm. Mahvel, and it has certain acoustic characteristics, and that's why they had their Mahvel there. But all around the room, there are pictures of the kings from the mythical times to to the present day, and you find very similar. Um, uh, they're big, huge panels. You know, they're probably about uh, yeah. maybe not quite a meter tall all the way around and um and you find similar ones in the uh, in the uh museum of sabah you know that used to be the house and they have them there too and a lot of the designs and uh, things are very similar so these maybe have been repeated so not exactly but quite a lot of them and uh, so you're not we have and of course you know this transfer technology both for etching and for lithography in the west anyway was very prevalent um it was you know de rigueur so um but the this whole thing is also very prevalent in these huge storytelling tiles that you find in these old houses and it might be something of interest to take a look at Thank you, Jane. As as usual, yeah, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Both the technology of of the transfer is prevalent outside of Iran, and it's prevalent in other contexts. It's very, very not medium dependent, uh, and it's been used in in various kind of productions. That's kind of the idea behind um, focusing on um, the 
paper, which is which is the shared usually the shared tool in all of these technologies. So the photography, the 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 transfer of the, the lithograph, the transfer on lacquer paintings on on miniature paintings. I mean, this is something that Roxburgh identifies initially on miniature paintings uh, of all things. You, you can actually find finished paintings that if you hold to the light, you can still see the pounce lines around them. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. This is a transferable technology amongst all sorts of productions. Um, and the kind of the idea behind me framing it in this way is that the the practices, the tools, and the the kind of the language of training hasn't start, suddenly kind of become upside down just because we have photography, because photography kind of falls squarely within known practices and tradition. Now there is a there is a special thing about photography that is not present in in these transfer mediums, and that's the relationship, the the one to one relationship to what's happening in front of the camera. That that that's the one differentiating factor. Uh, but I think the the idea was to when you are thinking of or positing a, a break or a shift to that extent at a point in time, you have to be able to find it in the way things are practiced and in the faith way things are imagined and the way things are trained and I don't see that necessarily within the Qajar period. I see that, but not in the media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So photography doesn't suddenly come and kind of change the way we think about painting or come in and change the way we, we kind of imagine space or imagine um, color or, or, or composition. Um, it does something very different. Um, so um, you're absolutely right. The transfer, the transfer technology is something that actually makes photography relate to other modes of, of, of image production. Um, because it's also a kind of transfer technology. And you could also, I, later. I used to be able to go to the Bazaar de Jome and find these act, the actual, uh, you know, drawings with the holes in them. And you used to be able to, I don't know if <laughs> you can now, yeah. but you used, to, you used to be able to go to Bazaar de Jome and find them there, you know, buy them for, you know, a few reals. And, and they were they were accessible. Yeah. yeah. They're not things that people keep. That's why they're very. There's a whole lot of them right, right now in the Harvard Art Museum, in that one album. But it's not something that that you can easily find in the art museum where of the art is stored. It's actually part mm -hmm. of the archive of the art museum. <laughs> so if you go to the Smithsonian and you look into the archive, you find you find them, but you don't <laughs> find them kind of shuffled with the muse, miniature paintings or things that go on, um, on the walls. They're part mm -hmm. of the archival, um, remnants of that art. Once again, thank you very much, Shamla. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for that intervention as well from Jane. And it was a pleasure to see you recently in Leiden too. Um, if there are no more questions or comments, um, I think Shabna and John, we've uh, we've probably tired you out. You've been amazing. You've been inspirational. Um, I'm totally converted to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> using images as documents and uh, I think everybody will join me in thanking you for this really wonderful thank presentation you. well done thank you very much and thank you Professor Tabakulitari for co-organizing uh, the session and uh, without further ado I'm going to wish you all a wonderful rest of the day or evening for those of us here in Europe and I look forward to seeing you again next month, Monday, remember, the 16th of October, where we will look at documents from 8th century Afghanistan. But actually, the themes that came up today um, uh, will also apply, but, you know, breaking out of um, these straitjackets that our fields have created, whether it's a term realism or that um, gets a different coloring in a different region, and very similar kinds of things happen in our period as well, in the medieval period. So I look forward to continuing the conversation with you all. I wish you a wonderful rest of the day or evening. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Shabnam. Thank you, Dr. Azad. Have a lovely day. Thank you very much, Dr. Azad. Thank you, Thank you so yourself. much. I've, it's been a lovely end Thank to you, my Shabnam. long and difficult day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.